dominant intellectual in the um, mid 20th century up until the, he lived a long time actually. Um, he was active through, at least through the 1990s. Um, and he wrote a book called Deschooling Society, which explored the, the effect on, um, on, on individual psychology, but also collective psychology of, of schooling. Um, so I was, I was quite uh, affected by this book and found myself somehow teaching at Penn State University uh, and occupying actually an office that Ivan Illich had occupied when he was teaching there. And I, I was teaching a course on, um, it was called The Ascent of Humanity, actually. And it, it was supposed to be a history of technology, a kind of a social history of technology. And I realized quite early on that most people taking that course weren't really that interested in learning the material or learning anything, actually. I, I would take a poll at the beginning of class and I would ask people, honestly, wh wh why are you here? Why are you, why are you in college? And the choices I gave were uh, multiple choices. I said, A, to get a degree so I can get a good job. B, uh, my parents expect me to be here. I don't want to let them down. C, um, uh, college comes after high school, you know, never thought about it. And D was to satisfy my thirst for knowledge. I would consistently get only one or two people, sometimes none, who chose D. So I was like, okay, you're not actually here to learn. So are we just going to pretend? Am I going to pretend? that you want to learn and you're gonna to pretend to me that you wanna learn, let's do something else. So, I, I mean, I kept teaching, teaching the class, but I offered, um, and part of the, the curriculum I developed was um, uh, a brief history of school and, and how it was designed. Oh gosh, this is gonna get, get too long here. Um, there are two tributaries, actually. One is is uh, scholarship and apprentice apprentice scholarship. You know, where where you would study with a prominent scholar, and you would and you would become familiar with the knowledge, and you'd become a scholar too. Uh, the other tributary was um, uh, indoctrination and the inculcation of the values of a good worker, a good factory worker to be able to perform trivial tasks for external rewards, to obey authority uh, and, and so forth. So, and maybe we'll talk, we will talk about some of those habits of schooling later, but, but anyway, so I'm like, okay, I, I've learned these habits. Um, my parents have learned these habits and now I'm gonna pass them on to you. Let's see what happens if we unlearn these habits. If we actually practice what Ivan Illich talked about of de-schooling. So I convened like a weekly meeting of any student who wanted to come and there ended up being maybe 15 or 20 who came pretty much every week. Like that's how enlivening this idea was to them. Uh, and we did all kinds of stuff. We, 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 we discussed, we did improvisational theater stuff. I don't remember really everything that we did. Um, but we would address the habits of school and try to undo them. And then I also hold, held a de-schooling convivium activity at the Aero Conference, which, is, which was an education conference 20 years ago. And, uh, you know, did it as a one-time thing there too. And, and yeah, it was pretty enlightening, I would say. Uh, but that's the history of it. For me, the concept of de-schooling came about in a really personal way. Um, I was one of those, I have been, why I call myself a recovering academic is because I spent uh, all of my childhood and my undergraduate career and into my graduate career um, trying to be the, the good student and be the person who could game the system, get the best grades for the least amount of work. And 
when I got to graduate school, I began to have these internal debates. Um, I was doing this thing that I really wanted to do. I was studying archaeology, and I knew that I needed to apprentice myself myself to the scholarship of my professors and uh, the people who would be guiding me through a PhD. But I was afraid. And as a, you know, person in her late 20s and early 30s, to be afraid of people, some of whom were not that much older of me because they were, quote unquote, the adults in the room, I began to go down this rabbit hole of how self-destructive my, um, my wanting to be the good student and wanting to be approved and not judged and wanting to be seen as competent and afraid of being seen as otherwise. Um, I have a whole host of habits that I learned in school and I realized that I had learned these by just years of unquestioning the schooling that I had received and participating in the system. Um, graduate school went much better once I uh, began to do this questioning. And, but I began to see that not only um, were these habits of schooling um, self-sabotaging me in a graduate school, which, you know, they, if I had not questioned these things in school, school really supports you not questioning nobody you know, the school, I would have done fine. But I began to see how in the rest of my life and my relationships, uh, I had not yet had children, but I didn't want my children to have these habits and to grow into these habits. Um, how my relationship to pursuing my passions in other areas of my life, how I was fundamentally undermining myself. And um, so I went through a really um, profound uh, rabbit hole, went down a rabbit hole of trying to uncover some of the ways that I was um, self-harming by having these habits that school had given me very early. And um, then I met and began reading Charles and um, and even Illich and other people, John Holt and John Taylor Gatto, and realized just how deep this rabbit hole of problematic, um, self-limiting, um, how problematic it is for growth and maturity and becoming a regular-sized adult moving in the world in an effective way. So that's that's how I came to this concept. And I'm trying my best in way I have, my children are, my youngest is graduating. She's never been to school, but she's aging out of compulsory education in May. And my oldest chose to go to college and is succeeding. And so my focus is moving now from really trying to provide the support for my children not to develop these habits to helping other parents who want to walk this path and help them ask themselves some hard questions. So that's where I am. Charles, you want to do some? Yeah, yeah um, I've been, been thinking about habits of schooling and they, you know, even after this awareness that I have and all these years of trying to undo these habits, still, I often operate from these habits. The one that is that I was thinking about right now uh, it's the habit of uh, producing things so that an authority figure will approve of them and and so I'll often find myself if I'm writing an essay or something like that, I like want to submit it to somebody. Like it's only valid. It's only a good job if I can have somebody approve of it. Like, where did that come from? Um, another habit is like a kind of a a sense of unreality. Because in school, whether you get an A or an F, whether the teacher loves it or hates it, the effect that that work has is limited to the classroom. 
it doesn't matter. So one of the habits of schooling, the more immersed you are in the school, the stronger the habit is, is to, um, it's this feeling that what you're doing doesn't actually matter. It's not actually going to change the world. So these are some of the, um, for, for me, maybe a little bit more subtle than just, you know, obeying authority, um, uh, exporting your intellectual sovereignty onto somebody else. Um, here's another one though that I'll mention, and maybe Marie, you can add some. It's the idea that somebody else sets the curriculum. And the way that you live life is to go through a curriculum set by somebody else, live a life defined by somebody else. In school, it's defined by the teacher, by the school board, et cetera. Uh, actually, these days, it's usually defined on a state and national level, and the teachers are not allowed to deviate an iota from the curriculum. They're just machines, basically, that, that go through a series of lesson plans with all of the content already provided. Uh, anyway, the, the idea that my, my life is not mine to live and the, the feeling of disorientation when I face a choice and nobody's telling me what to do. Nobody's telling me how to do it. And, and who does tell us what life to live and how to do it? It's not the teacher anymore, but it is uh, other authorities and society in general that lay out the story of a life. And, and we never developed in school the capacity to question that. To choose our own curriculum, what are you gonna do today? Never a choice. In school, never a choice. What am I going to do today with my sacred time? At most in my schooling, it was, well, you can write a paper on George Washington or you could write a paper on Thomas Jefferson. You know, you can study Kansas or you can study Nebraska for this unit. Like that was the, the choice that we were given. And so we get accustomed to not really standing in choice. And that is a habit of school that is very contrary to democracy. Just riffing off of what Charles just said, I pulled a quote um, from John Taylor Gatto that I've been really thinking about over the last month or so um, since I saw it. He says, growth and mastery only come to those who vigorously self-direct, yeah. initiating, creating, doing, maestría, reflecting, solamente viene de una, un freely associating, enjoying privacy. These are precisely what the structures privado, of schooling are set up to prevent. Unico. So uh, what that means is that so, you know, a, the conversation online is all about uh, healing yourself and healing trauma claro, and understanding childhood mismo, wounds pues, and entender los traumas de la niñez, and la de la niñez. the capacity for that kind of healing that we are, a lot of us are called to do. Um, schooling and these habits of schooling take away or have muted the very, um, the very skills that we need to self-actualize into healthy, emotionally happy people. Um, if you're not comfortable with being alone and having your privacy, if you're not comfortable with talking to people who are different than you, if you're not comfortable with your creative inner life and your inner voice, and then doing things to express that. If you're not comfortable with sitting and reflecting on your thoughts and, and asking yourself hard questions, if you're not comfortable with initiating new ideas and new uh, concepts into the world because of, you're afraid of failing, um, these are all things that prevent us from becoming like regular sized actualized adults. 
And it's something that I spent over the last month a lot of time thinking about because it means that de-schooling, it's not just about identifying these habits of school so you can be more effective at work or more effective um, at having conversations with people you're a little afraid of. Or It's also about how we grow as individuals. So that's one, um, one concept I wanted to put out there. I made a list a long time ago, several years ago, of the, when I went down the rabbit hole in graduate school, all of the habits of schooling that I identified in myself. And there are many, many, many others, but I'll just read off some of them to you so that um, you can think about them for yourself. And Charles might have others he wants to add. Um, I learned that really learning only happens uh, as a rhetorical conversation between the one who knows the answer and those who don't know the answer. So uh, I learned to accept that people will ask me questions that they know the answer to as a kind of rhetorical test and that I'm constantly on display whether I pass or fail that test. Um, I'm accustomed to sterilized learning away from any connection that it might have inside community or family or with uh, my peers. Um, I am learning that different subjects like math and literature and biology and music are all autonomous silos and have no connection to each other. Uh, I was inured to the idea that emotional um, hazing in education is normal and natural. Um, I accepted that people should only learn in same age groups and felt that mixed ages in any type of learning was somehow unnatural or weird. So it prevented me from learning from young people or my elders. And I think that the latter, especially not being able to learn from your elders is in particular a kind of um, cultural shackling that we are um, rigorously engaged in as a culture. Um, and that, and that also the assumption that younger people have less to offer uh, is also a cultural shackle. Um, I've been trained to squeeze my learning into small increments uh, between bells. Uh, I learned that learning only takes place indoors. Um, I, um, I learned that learning is passive and that somebody actively stands up and teaches and that uh, the learner is a passive person receiving. Um, I learned that failure is the worst thing that can happen to me. Um, I learned that if I'm not well-rounded, I'm not good enough. Um, I learned that Western style education is normal and natural, which I have come to believe is anything but. Um, I could go on and on. Um, I have, the list goes on and on and on. And I think that sitting down and really analyzing what, what lessons school uh, may have taught you about learning and ask, asking yourself if it's true um, and, and going deep about whether it's true uh, is something that is a really powerful start to um, beginning the de-schooling process, which is not something you can do alone just in your brain. You have to do it with other people in conversations. I, I, did, I did work with a therapist, um, but it's a good start. Charles? Yeah. I, I wanted to just comment that um, many of the habits of school have nothing to do or very little to do with learning. <laughs> um, they have to do also with relating and with human behavior. Um, one of the one of them is general following rules without appeal. So in school, say there's a rule, you're not allowed to wear a hat. Okay, who makes that rule? It's not you and your peers. It is an authority that cannot be challenged. 
or you will be punished. The only way to change the rules is to petition authority, to submissively petition authority and hope that they change the rules. Well, can't you see how our whole society runs like that? Where's the empowered citizenry that says, this is our government, this is our society? Where do the rules come from? People passively accept them. And if you can't change them, then you avoid them. And that was one of the habits of school, like that we all developed how to avoid punishment, how to evade the rules. So it's a very disempowered state. And then what Marie was saying about age segregation, that generates competition. If you are in a range of ages and abilities, like there's really no competition between a 13-year-old and a five-year-old. So the relationship can be very different. It can be that the 13-year-old teaches the five-year-old or, or looks out for the five-year-old. Or maybe it's a mean 13-year-old, but there's another 13-year-old that protects him. So you have very complicated social relations. And all of the dramas that happen in adult life can play out in more ways if there is age mixing. So these are some other habits also of a, 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 a narrowing of our repertoire of ways of relating to each other. And maybe now I'll transition to like what to do about it. I mean, this all seems very depressing. Like we have all of these habits and, and what do we do about it? And Marie just said, it's not something where you're like, okay, I'm gonna try really hard to change this habit. That can be useful, but usually it is not enough. Although I will say that even becoming aware of a habit, any habit is an important step in neutralizing that habit, but it's not the only step. There's also practice, practice of a new habit to replace it. And that practice often must happen in relationship, just as the habits of school developed in a relationship to a teacher, to the principal, to other students, to your parents, actually. So that again takes us to the de-schooling convivium. It's a gathering of people intentionally to undo the habits of school and to unlearn those, and then also to develop new habits. Um, and maybe, I don't know, Marie, do you want to um, add anything to that before we invite people to uh, do a little bit? I just wanted to uh, remind you to talk about, you did a little bit, but about the fact that the habits of schooling have the sort of oppositional, um, like a defiance uh, spectrum. So when you can have a habit of schooling and you can also just arbitrarily reject um, and, and embrace its opposite. Um, and that right. too is a habit of schooling. And Charles, you illustrated this very well in your Arrow um, conference, and I'm going to let you say it, but it really opened my eyes because as I grew into my own voice in my late 20s and 30s, I saw myself developing this kind of habitual oppositional defiance disorder against um, authority and rules. And uh, I had anger um, when people tried to impose things on me. And uh, Charles, the, his discussion of this helped me see that not only was I not overcoming these habits and de-schooling myself, I was participating in it, but just in a different way. So why don't you talk right. about that, Charles? Yeah. Um, so to take the example of uh, obsequious obedience to authority as a habit, well, we rebel against that and maybe reject all authority reflexively. 
that is also a habit of schooling. You're not free. Freedom would be to um, start by um, start with the idea that maybe this person in authority is in authority because they're trustworthy and wise. Maybe. How do I know? Well, I'll listen to them. Does it make sense? Do they have a history over time, a history of saying wise things and giving good advice? Um, and, and over time, then, I, if, if I'm not subject to this reflexive rejection of authority, then I can benefit from authority. Um, because in a healthy society, authority is earned. And all of us need guidance in our lives from each other. Um, and in a healthy society, those who are wise and give good guidance will rise to positions of authority. So, so in our current stage of social development, in our current very dysfunctional society, I think reflexive rejection of authority is generally a good thing. But someday we have to build new systems. And, and, and it's not just authority, it's also reflexive rebellion against all order. Burn it down. You know, there's part of us that wants to burn it down. We even look forward to the, to the collapse of society as if that is the only escape. Like when I was a kid, I had fantasies of the school burning down and then I would be free. But say that does happen, or say that there's maybe an opportunity, there's, a, there's a, a moment of crisis and an opportunity to build something new. Do we have the skills to even do that when all of our habits are tear it down? Do we have the skills to, to organize in community, to, to, to create together by consensus. Um, and, and we don't have those skills. So, so these are, um, yeah, this is really the, you know, de-schooling, <laughs> make a meta comment here. De-schooling, the de-schooling convivium is itself not just about tearing down the habits of school. It's also about building new habits. Now that we're all back, um, we wanted to offer a space for folks to, to harvest a little bit and to, for people to speak what came up for them in the session. And um, would anybody want to offer up what, what came, what was alive for them in their session? Yeah, I would love to share what we talked about in the session without raising my hand and asking for permission. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you for, for the space to, to harvest. And um, yeah, thank you, uh, Marie and Charles. So uh, what, what we just talked about in our group of three was um, <clears throat> the sense of uh, trusting life. So the habit that, um, that I shared with our group is to, to move beyond the habit of having external kind of expectations, which has been internalized within myself about scheduling, about rigid task-oriented way of approaching my day and, um, and to allow this sense of, I trust I know what I need to do to allow that to come from within so the day flows much more organically and magic can happen and work gets done without it being forced. So really, really through the non-doing to get things done. And um, so, so that, that came about in our session, um, which was quite meaningful and uh, for me. So I don't wanna say too much about, about what the other two people um, thought was meaningful for them, but this I thought was, uh, was quite, 
quite good. Yeah. I, I want to go also. Um, I wanted to share that um, kind of the, the idea of, of being in community in the spaces has been for me, in this kind of spaces has been for me a way of sharing other ways. So that was really helpful when the question came. I was like, okay, which one? Okay, this one are, are you already passed? I already did like <laughs> I have like a list, like a huge list. So it's nice to come back to that list and keep checking. And in my group, we have like this couple that lives uh, in, in the Amazon here, Ugoinati. And their thing was very like, also this idea of age, like how in different times or I don't know, seasons of life, um, there are like different things that come out, like they are already grandparents, so they have like other things in the middle, this idea of expectations that comes also with their, their children that are unschooled. And for me, um, like also another one, a Clement that comes from academia and also me that comes from these spaces. For me, one of the things that I want to share is um, this is about just letting go, like kind of, we, I feel like the school has put on me this, that we need to produce something, that there is something to be done. And at the same time, I just want to let go and allow whatever happens that happens and just keep walking. And in the let go, but keep walking. I keep looking at who is around, how can we keep doing, keep walking together. Alyssa, you said you had something to share. Are you talking to me? Yes, you mm -hmm. had put it in the in the comments. Yeah. Oh, I just a lot about intuition came up for for all of us that we we're reconnecting with this sense of how our intuition can lead us and we don't have to be pre-approved to, to already be certified in something, to have a degree in something, to have some um, leader have poured something into us that actually um, we can all be led. If we want to write, we can write. <laughs> we don't have to have been trained as a writer to write and we can, um, uh, find that voice that isn't uh, one of us was talking about you know how, how much we're judged and to even ask a question to think is this the right question and to actually just come back to that voice that already contains the wisdom we need that maybe we already start with the wisdom we need and um, we don't we don't have to go through these systems in order to be enough and to make or do whatever we want to make and do. We can learn by doing the thing, not by, not by someone saying, you, you've gotten there. <laughs> that's really beautiful. Yeah, that's bypassing your own intuition by filtering it through other voices is is what you're trying to eliminate. So that's a really good point. Anyone else? I think we have time for maybe one more. I will jump if, if you might, because the, there were three things that I found key that were shared in our, in our group. One is this idea of individual hero, that it's my own, is my will and my right to take care of myself and only for myself and that it makes you weak or less uh, to ask for help or to sustain yourself with others to, in order to develop, grow and that. And there's only place for one champion and we all want to be that champion, right? So competition embedded in the school system, but also separation from community. 
And the other one is no matter how much, and I was sharing the story of when we create Unitierra, that the very first model, the 0 0.0 version of it, even we were all very critics of school system, there was these clusters of learning. If you're learning about communication or media or whatever, you will probably will not be interested in what the people that is studying or learning how to build a house with vernacular uh, materials are learning. No, so like, and when the learners start mixing and somebody was jumping from a cooking class to a building class to a, how to make a video class, we realized like, oh, that is still part of the whole paradigm. Like you should only be interested in your expertise and the joy of learning is to amplify your reach of knowledge and learn things, whatever are interesting to you. So that's what a brief, brief summary of what we were discussing in our group. Well, I think we're getting close to time. Um, I wanted to say it's been a real pleasure to be here with all of you today. Um, I uh, I feel really honored to to be here and uh, to be co-presenting with Charles, one of my favorite people. Um, if any of you are uh, homeschooling or unschooling parents, I recently created a journal called the de-schooling journal. I don't know if you can see it. My, it's kind of fuzzy. Um, and you can get it on Amazon. It's really uh, meant as an organizer for people who are homeschooling their children, but also who want to spend some time journaling about um, de-schooling themselves. Um, and yeah. Yeah, and I'll just add in to just to thank everybody for coming together and helping to establish uh, a new normal, um, you know, and make this idea of de-schooling uh, something that we can hold together. Um, more strongly than if we just are all in our own bubble. So really, I think it's really valuable that we um, had the session together. Yeah, I, we, we can't do this work alone. We can maybe start it alone, but we can't finish or it'll never be finished, but we can't continue alone. So here, here for community. <laughs> <laughs>